Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly is speaking to Otto Wurdmüller von Elk and George Sayers, the joint CEOs and founders of UDS. So Otto, if you can tell us now, are you able to assist the country when it comes to minimizing and hopefully eliminating one day the theft of cables and the theft of diesels, which is rampant at the moment? So Martin, yes, we've been in the business for many years. And what we found is that we are incredibly effective, okay, at minimizing the cable theft. I don't think we'll ever get rid of it, but generally without exception, wherever we go, we have a reduction of at least 90% of the cable theft. And that is on multiple clients, over 90 sites right around the country, from Cape Town to Tabazimbi to Richards Bay to Katu. And cost-wise, I mean, people will imagine that this is an enormous cost. What sort of cost are we losing in South Africa? The opportunity loss is huge. And how can you come in at a reasonable level of charging? So, Martin, what we do is we have, obviously, we, we put drones up, okay, and we're very effective at night. So, from seeing absolutely nothing on the ground with, you know, conventional security it's absolutely a complete waste of time you can see nothing it's dangerous we give eyes to the ground security we, we make them safe we find the perpetrators and we've been incredibly successful um, at doing this from a cost point of view it is absolutely minimal um, especially when you look at the at the losses okay that the uh, mining industry that Eskom and everybody with cable in the ground, okay, it's an absolute epidemic. And the costs associated, never mind with just replacing the cable, it's the consequential losses that really, um, really make this stand out, okay. It's absolutely minimal compared to the losses that is being sustained. Tell us what you've got in your armory here. How many people are you employing? And uh, George, uh, what, how do you prepare these people to do this very important job? All the pilots that we, that we employ and work with us, they learn how to fly very effectively at night time. And we have a different kind of uh, platform that we fly. We go into the areas, we understand the area. And that's what we've done well, Otto and I. We've gone, we understood the place, we've got good managers on the line and we fly different, different platforms to help the ground troops. That's, that is most, and it's very, very simple. There's really not very big secret source about the whole thing, Martin. And also you seem to come out of really uh, trying to protect our nature. You wanted to help us with uh, all sorts of uh, game reserve problems that they had. And, and then you developed into business. And give us an idea of how you've grown in size. Okay, so we started in 2013. Um, we were basically the first drone organization in the country at the time. There were no regulations. Um, and we, we dedicated our thinking in the beginning to try and wage the war against um, you know, wildlife crime, more specifically with rhino. Um, we spent a lot of time in Kruger National Park, in Shishlubi and Falozi, in Zimbabwe, Malawi and Botswana. So we really, you know, cut our teeth in flying in these, in these wonderful game reserves. Um, in 2015, um, the regulations were promulgated and we were actually grounded. We were flying in Kruger National Park, we were grounded. Uh, we then approached civil aviation and they said there are regulations, we have to comply. So we did that um, in October. Um, we got our ROC, which is the license to fly, basically. And in retrospect, it was a very interesting time because we were allowed to fly the kind of missions that nowhere else in the world are you allowed to fly other than military. So we were allowed to fly at night, you know, 25 kilometers, light off 1,600 feet above ground level, which is really the domain of military. Um, and we flew there in those kind of environments for a few years. We had commercial clients seeing what, we'd, what we were doing um, on television, and we were approached by our first commercial client, I um, can't remember what year it was, probably 2016, and they had cable theft, copper cable theft problems. 
and we started there the next day. There's a whole lot of compliance that we had to go through with civil aviation because we weren't flying in national parks, very safe. We were now flying over a national key point. Anyway, we got the admin right and we started flying. And we changed their lives forever in terms of cable theft, where they used to have sort of 200 uh, guards at night. Um, we reduced that down to eight and we reduced the cable theft down to 5% of what it used to be. And that's generally the kind of statistics that we work on currently, and that's five years later. Um, we now, in those days, we grew from three or four pilots, five or six aeroplanes. We now have 250 aircraft. Uh, we have 250 pilots. And judged as an airline, which we are, um, we're probably the biggest airline in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're definitely the biggest drone organization worldwide by a factor of probably five. And it's an amazing set of circumstances that, that actually made that happen. It was one of our unique crime problems that we have in this country. Our um, initial recognition of the rhino crime problem and also the South African civil aviation's very forward thinking in terms of the regulations. They embraced um, drones by saying that they're going to regulate them on exactly the same basis as any airline, which they did. So our procedures and everything are exactly the same to fly a 747 or to fly one of our drones. There's no difference. So that created a very interesting set of circumstances that we could fly under regulations. Anywhere else in the world really, like the US, there are no regulations to fly. You have to apply for exemption and each flight has to be on an exemption basis. So it's not really a commercial formula. And that's why the circumstances were teed up for us to be successful. And that's where we were. So it's quite a unique South African story biggest, most sophisticated outside the military anywhere in the world. And what percentage of your activity and contribution is around security at the moment? And how much towards other activities, stockpile measuring and all that sort of activity? So currently we fly between five and 7,000 hours uh, a month. Um, and 90% of that would be attributable to security. And the other 10% is stockpile management, engineering services, um, you know, infrastructure inspection. So where, it, um, where you have dangerous environments to work on, like looking at, uh, at pylons and, and those kind of mining infrastructures. You know, some of the stuff you have to put up scaffolding, you have to climb into a silo. Now that would take days and a few hundred thousand rand. Now the pilot goes in, they open up the hatch, they fly inside the silo. They look for cracks and, and all that sort of things on video, not with human eye. So it's very, very useful on the engineering and survey side as well. Do you tie people up with contracts, strict contracts that they have to adhere to if they want to use your service? You get them to sign uh, some sort of commitment? Well, much to the, uh, the horror of our principles, um, because we're owned by a public company now, which is Bidvest, um, George and I uh, started this business. we probably a bit loose and wild, okay? And we don't like contracts because personally, I hate contracts. It t ties you in, okay, it breeds complacency. So without exception, really, um, most of our relationships with the mines and with the big SOEs, okay, are month to month or day to day. So we're only there if we're effective, okay. We hate tenders, we hate long-term contracts, okay. We're only as good as our effectiveness the previous night. And we're happy to live and die by that. So does someone just give you a month's notice if they don't want you anymore? They can give us a day's Damn. notice. <laughs> a day's notice. Yeah. We haven't been given notice yet on any client. That's fantastic. And you also go into the actual manufacture of these drones, which is quite a daring thing to do. So initially when we started, there was nothing commercial that we could buy. We had to fly for long periods of time. Um, at night and we had to be quiet. So we had to develop our own fixed wing aircraft, um, which is about two and a half meters wingspan, conventional aeroplane type drone, not a, a multi-rotor. So we, there was nothing non-military that was available. So we actually developed them ourselves and we flew them. And today we, we probably manufacture 70, 80% of our drones. The other ones we buy commercially, the ones that we use for engineering. Um, are generally commercially available. But our unique 
sort of military type uh, requirements without military budgets forced us into the innovation, okay, which we did. And South Africa has got a history of innovation. It's a Burmaka Plan kind of mentality. And um, you know what's amazing is the US um, guys have been here, they've had a look at what we do, and they gobsmacked at the sophistication and the cheap um, you know, manufacturing costs that we've done here. We set the standards internationally. So not only at the forefront of technology when it comes to security, but I, I heard you say you're using 3D printing to de develop some of this product. Yeah, so a lot of our gimbals for our cameras, our thermal cameras and what have you, you can go and buy, buy these things and they, you know, 10,000 euro um, a time. We can't afford that. We really can't. Um, we don't have the budgets. So we just had a look. Our engineering guys had a look at it and we can make them. We 3D print, you know, most of our gimbals. A lot of the parts for the aircraft are 3D printed. Um, it's really coming into its own. Five years ago when we started 3D printing, it was really... a in really new expensive technology now we're printing just about everything and i see you training a lot of people which is a magic word in south africa you need to train people how many people have you trained and what sort of people are coming to be trained well it's actually an interesting question initially when we started um we didn't have a pool of drone pilots to 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 call on because they didn't exist so we actually went and had a look at the, at the hobbyists. So these would be radio control you know, hobbyists, um, highly skilled guys. And in the beginning, you, need to, you, need, you, know, you needed high skills okay, of flying because it was conventional takeoff and landing um, at night, no runways. So we took the best of the hobbyists okay, all around the country. Um, and they were our start. Okay, We still have a few of them around, our trainers and what have you. But the skills have changed quite significantly with the change in technology. So the technology has gone from con you know, conventional takeoff and landing to you know, something we call VTOL, which is vertical takeoff and landing. And it's become easier and less piloting skills and more an operator. Although they still have to go through the Civil Aviation Pilot's License, it's probably 75 to 80% of a normal manned aircraft, uh, all the same you know, subjects they have to do, the same checkout procedures, same licensing, same health. In fact, the health standards for a drone pilot are higher than a private pilot, okay, because they're classified as commercial, strangely enough. So we have to have a high level of medical, okay, if the guy's colorblind, he can't fly a drone. It's quite a, it's quite a, a story. Sure. And so the, the issue that I want to know about now is safety. We sometimes think, wow, these drones are flying around, you know, what are they going to hit? And would they hit any human beings? What is your safety record like? So in terms of civil aviation regulations, you have to have five post holders. One of them is actually a safety manager, um, as all, you know, licensed aircraft, you know, sort of, um, you know, charter flights or commercial airlines. So we have one. Um, and he's full time and we analyze our incidents and accidents and um, th this month is actually the lowest we've ever had on record and that's really about training about interpreting what the root cause of the problem and the failure is bringing that back into training okay bringing that back into our manufacturing environment to make sure that the components that we produce um, are more reliable so in normal commercial and manned aircraft, it's highly regulated because you've got humans on board. In, in drone manufacture, uh, very few of them are type certified, which is called, which you have to do when you have a normal aircraft. So that would take years and years to get a commercially saleable um, manned aircraft. Okay, it takes five to 10 years to get a new one into the system because of the type certification. They don't have that with drones, so they're obviously made to a lower standard. But we're very concerned with safety. We have a fantastic safety record. We've flown probably 300,000 hours um, and we've had no loss of life, no major incidents uh, to, to, you know, to infrastructure or what have you. So we've got an exemplary safety record. And finally, I want to get back to the original point. Why are you so convinced that you can help the South African economy by reducing or even eliminating cable theft and help the South African economy with problems we have of pipeline pillaging, of diesel, and every other security aspect. 
can you just maybe give us an insight into how this happens that you're able to secure lines, you're able to secure railway, transport, mines, etc. So if you look at most of the criminal activity, it's at night. And you know, the criminals um, think that they can't be seen. So they behave very, very differently at night as would during the day. So we fly above them, we are unseen, we unheard, and we are incredibly effective to directing the troops. Normal, um, normal guarding is absolutely blind. The criminals can see them coming. If they in a vehicle, they can see the headlights, they can hear the noise, they can hear people, okay, where we're completely silent and anonymous. So people behave very differently. We catch them. We've had thousands of arrests. Okay, we have arrests probably every single day. It is the only technology that is viable if these criminal activities are happening at night. What is more important is that we fly unannounced and we fly from different areas. That is, of course, for safety. And that is very, very important. So they cannot, the criminals cannot predict where we are, where we fly from and so on. So just the protection of our own pilots as well.